You guys, we are in for such a, a special, such a special treat. Uh, Bonnie, we so honor you. We so honor um, uh, uh, Mahesh. We so honor uh, what you have pioneered in our generation. Um, we don't count it lightly. Uh, to have you here with us tonight. Um, we don't want to be familiar with the anointing that's on you. It's with great honor and appreciation in our hearts that we celebrate Jesus tonight and what he's accomplishing through your ministry. Let's celebrate Jesus as Bonnie Shavda comes. All right. Hey. Guys, stretch out your hands. Father, we thank you so much for this general. We thank you, Lord, for this, this, this one who walks in that, that, that Melchizedek place of king and priest. On behalf of a priest in this region, Bonnie, we receive you for who you are. You don't have to change because of our atmosphere or culture. You get to be fully you. And Father, we honor who Bonnie is tonight. And we pray, Lord, that it would be so easy for the best of who she is to shine bright tonight. Father, we thank you, Lord, that this isn't a Darren idea. God, you ordered tonight. This is a prescription that the doctor ordered. And so, Father, we give you thanks. And we give you praise for this holy moment. In Jesus' name, amen. A circle of grass, smooth as a lawn, met her eyes, with dark trees dancing all around it. And then, oh joy, for he was there. The huge lion, shining white in the moonlight, with his huge black shadow underneath him. But for the movement of his tail, he might have been a stone lion. But Lucy never thought of that. She never stopped to think whether he was a friendly lion or not. She rushed to him. She felt her heart would burst if she lost a moment. The next thing she knew, she was kissing him and putting her arms as far around his neck as she could and burying her face in the beautiful, rich silkiness of his mane. Aslan, Aslan, dear, Aslan, sobbed Lucy at last. The great beast rolled over on his side so that Lucy fell, half sitting and half lying between his front paws. He bent forward and just touched her nose with his tongue. His warm breath came all around her. She gazed up into his large, wise face. Welcome, child, he said. Aslan, said Lucy, you're bigger. That's because you're older, little one, answered he. Not because you are? I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. For a time, she was so happy that she did not want to speak, but Aslan spoke. Lucy, he said, we must not lie here for long. You have work in hand, and much time has been lost today. Yes, wasn't it a shame, said Lucy. I saw you all right. They wouldn't believe me. They're all so... From somewhere deep inside Aslan's body, there came the faintest suggestion of a growl. I'm sorry, said Lucy, who understood some of his moods. I didn't mean to start slanging the others, but it wasn't my fault anyway, was it? The lion looked straight into her eyes. Oh, Aslan, said Lucy, you don't mean it was. How could I? I couldn't have left the others and come up to you alone. How could I? Don't look at me like that. Oh, well, I suppose I could. Yes, it wouldn't have been alone. I know not if I was with you, but what would have been the good? Aslan said nothing. You mean, said Lucy, Lucy rather faintly, that it would have turned out all right somehow? But how? Please, Aslan, am I not to know? 
to know what would have happened, child, said Aslan. No, nobody has ever told that. Oh, dear, said Lucy. But anyone can find out what will happen, said Aslan. If you go back to the others now and wake them up and tell them you have seen me again. And that you must all get up at once and follow me. What will happen? There's only one way of finding that out. Do you mean that is what you want me to do, gasped Lucy? Yes, little one. Will the others see you too, asked Lucy. Certainly not at first, said Aslan. Later on, it depends. But they won't believe me, said Lucy. It doesn't matter, said Aslan. Oh dear, oh dear, said Lucy. And I was so pleased at finding you again. I thought you'd let me stay. I thought you'd come roaring in and frighten all the enemies away like last time. And now everything's going to be horrid. It is hard for you, little one, said Aslan. But things never happen the same way twice. It has been hard for all of us in Narnia before now. Lucy buried her head in his mane to hide from his face. But there must have been magic in his mane. She could feel lion strength going into her. Quite suddenly, she sat up. I'm sorry, Aslan, she said. I'm ready now. Now you are a lioness, said Aslan. And now all Narnia will be renewed. But come, we have no time to lose. C.S. Lewis in Prince Caspian, the chapter called The Return of the Lion. And we have just heard words that describe the season of revival that we are in. And we have heard from this beautiful story instructions for us, simple instructions for us. So you can go back and find it and read it yourself. It's out of chapter 10 of Prince Caspian of C.S. Lewis. Actually, I find this quite imaginative, but I have to let you know, I didn't think it up. It was during the worship as the swan song man <laughs> took us up there and suddenly I had a very clear moment of us as a collective Lucy hiding ourselves in his mane in the lion of the tribe of Judah's mane and I had to go and look it up frankly I could hear your responses. There were words and there were ideas and there were thoughts in here that were not imaginary in the sense of not real. But you were connecting to something living that was resonating and speaking and saying yes to you. We are living in a new day a different kind of what we call revival, something like we haven't seen or experienced before. And in this one, every single person has a unique and definitive and powerful piece to contribute. And we need everyone contributing. Last Sunday, I preached at our church in Charlotte, and I intended to talk about prayer and make some very specific points of prayer, on prayer. And I may do that because there is a new thing about the revival that God is sparking now, and that is there is coming 
a new drawing, a word of the Lord for every Christian who hears his voice to gather together in corporate prayer and fasting. And this will be one of the initial hallmarks of the new season of revival that we are in. And I strongly urge you, I strongly encourage you, wherever there is the opportunity, and particularly if God has called you to a church body to join there in corporate prayer, if you want to miss his visitation, don't do it. But if you want to be in his visitation, I believe with all my heart that the place to go to is to the place of the church in corporate prayer. I might talk a little bit more about that, but I intended to encourage once again our congregation, an amazing group of people. We aren't static. If something is living, it grows, it changes. I agree with that. I think there is way too much drifting around in the body of Christ. And there is a unique wisdom in God calling us to encounter with one another in corporate prayer because it will help us individually get more of a revelation that indeed what Jesus said, when two or more of you are gathered together, I'm right there standing in the midst. Can you see me? Can you hear me? I'm here and there is no other people on earth. Davos can't do this. Our Congress can't do this. The United Nations can't do this. In fact, I would suggest there's quite possibly a different kind of presence in that gathering. But I think that I need to get uh, restoring the foundation's prayer because I'm noticing I'm a cynic. That's not good because as Swan Song teaches us, it's not about the circumstances. Right? So, when I opened my mouth, I found myself exhorting our congregation who has been faithfully engaged in corporate prayer together every week and fasting long corporate fast together twice a year every year for the last 28 years the friday night watch hours of prophetic worship and intercession we have come to realize that it is in that atmosphere uniquely that you will find the counsel of the lord and it is uniquely in that particular place that God has an opportunity to move us from recognizing things very individualistically and very me-centered. I got to tell you, I am so tired of the gospel in America being pre presented as a self-help method. This is not a self-help method. This is a death sentence. There isn't a single author in this book who didn't ultimately give up their entire life and security. And many of them actually died by the sword as martyrs witnessing for this message. And I think that of all the collective churches in all the nations, there is probably none that has received more than America. And I believe that the piper has come calling. I really believe that the Lord of the church is at the door of America and saying, I have given you much. And it's time to give back. It's time to give back. So I heard myself make this analogy. And I was being instructed. I was opening my own ears to listen to the Lord as I was talking. But 
he reminded me of the parable of the talent, and we all know it very well. In recent years, we've often used that parable as God giving us, you know, skills and different creative things and different unique aspects of our personality. No, in the talent, the rich landowner gave them money. Gave them money. And there are some scholars that say that the one talent, which we've thought, oh, you know, he got maybe, I don't know, a 50 cent piece, maybe a gold double eagle or something. No, I've heard some Bible scholars suggest that the one talent was an entire year's salary all at once given to that man. And I thought about that and I thought, you know, in these times, if suddenly someone walked up to me and gave me in cash my entire year's salary all at once, what would I do with it? What would I do with it? And I have to confess, I don't think that my first instinct, very first instinct, I might be able to grab it and get control on, but I'm not sure that my very first instinct would be to take it and find the best place to invest it and do all of that. I highly suspect that there would be a few I needs on the top of the list, a few crisis points on the top of the list. A few, well, I finally can on the top of the list, right? So we think of that individual that received that one talent in a very negative way, but I realized that I might possibly, uh, I can't really say put it in the bank anymore, but that's a whole nother story. This is an area, friends, where the church is, in America is really lagging. We, I, let me just stop right here. <sighs> Honestly, I want to apologize to the body of Christ on behalf of a generation of spirit-filled church leaders that have kept you infantile We have been too afraid to offend you, to hurt your feelings, that you might not like us anymore, that you might go away. We have been too afraid to be responsible to actually equip you to be the valiant, mature ones that God has already marked you to be. I apologize for our insecurity that has contributed to your contributed to your insufficiency. I apologize that we have been too lazy to think deeply about the real issues of our world and of our Bible theology and break it open with you and converse about it and work some of these things through so that your foundation is actually serving you that you might build on it. And just one of the many issues is the whole subject of finances. And perhaps, other than literal end of life considerations, which should be for every Christian, even 30 minutes into the faith, we should already have our end of life issues settled. Do you understand what I'm saying? These are aspects of what the great shepherd is suddenly going to require of us all. 
And in the midst of a very serious era, there is delirious joy and fellowship. It, it's like a, a, a wide contradiction that we are called to live in and dwell in. And though it is something new, and I believe we'll see new expressions, it's actually the original DNA of the body of Christ, the church, the city of God, Zion in the earth, that was birthed when the Shekinah, the manifest dynamic person of God in the spirit that dwelt where they could see him in the temple, in the tabernacle. And at a certain point, he moved out. Until the power of the cross and the resurrection in offering that gift and cleansing heaven and opening, say opening. opening, opening once and for all the separation between God's image bearers and their heavenly father. And when that opening occurred, it was shadowed, demonstrated as it happened in heaven, it was shadowed at the cross when the temple veil was rent. But when that veil was rent, there was no Shekinah back there. It was dark and empty in the Holy of Holies. But just a few days after the glorious Son of Man ascended to the Father in a new body. A body that was material. Say material. That could eat and walk and talk and touch and feel and walk through walls. And appear one place and appear another place. And at times, those who had known him best didn't recognize him because they were looking the wrong way. But when he spoke, their hearts opened. And they knew him. When he ascended to the Father, the Holy Spirit of God returned to creation. That's Pentecost. And I want you just to imagine with me for a moment in your mind that fire that dwelt behind that thick veil where priests and kings could stand in the antechambers and shout to God on earth their dilemma and get back from his direct presence the counsel of what to do and how to do it. Friends, I believe that that is the kind of presence God wants us to commune with in corporate prayer. Corporate prayer. That is many bodies gathered together in a certain place to pray and seek the Lord about his counsel. So as I was wanting to encourage our folks, I found myself talking about the parable of the talents. And I heard myself say something that I believe was some kind of question from the Lord. And I said this, I said, I believe that every Christian has been given that one talent. Yes. God may add to or build on it, but every Christian, because 
Every believer has been assigned to a living community. And I am calling for a return to the house of the Lord. Now, there are a lot of practical reasons. The Bible describes the church, the body of Christ, as a city, as the city of God. And cities are places that minorities, for instance, move into for refuge because in cities they will find others like themselves. Cities are places that people go to to find themselves, to find a place of free expression, perhaps lost to those most familiar to them for various reasons. Cities are places that people go to for economic and personal promotion and enrichment. Cities are centers of culture. It's culture creating is what cities are. And I think if we just pause for a moment with our access to current information and knowledge all the time, from the terrible days that this city, Seattle, was abused by interlopers, was literally wounded and cursed and trampled on by a violent spirit. When God looks at cities in scripture, he looks at them, and Jerusalem is the primary example, but she is an example. He looks at them as an individual woman. Can you imagine if what had happened to, you, to uh, Chop and Seattle had happened to your body, your physical body, what state you would be in? And these are some of the many reasons that we must come together to get the counsel of the Lord and begin to function from the place that he has already seated us in. But we're ignorant of what that place means and what it's for and how we function in it. And we do not function there in isolation. I'm in big trouble, Darren. Came up here with Aslan and his mane and the swan song and come on up. And I'm already trying to bring you down. There is a shift. There is a declaration. Remind me to come back to Seattle because I want to just possibly for just a moment, let that be an example of a piece, a portion of what church congregations in earth cities are meant to be and meant to do. And I believe that there is a fresh assignment that I will submit to you guys and your intercessors to pick up uh, a declaration for Seattle. We are seeing a lot that you guys have accomplished. I want to tell you, this man and his wife and the folks around him, this man is one of the most courageous and sincere and honest persons, human beings on the face of the earth. He is worthy of your trust. He is worth following. So, things like finances. We have held you captive in order to make sure we get your money. That doesn't give you the liberty to start being rebellious or unbelieving about your tithes and offerings. 
but the knowledge of the power and honestly what is in it, let me tell you, it is not only about sowing a seed and giving, getting a harvest, but how many other things have regularly even been spoken to us about the power of our money? Is anybody talking to us about practical investment? Is anybody teaching us on how to use that, what the Bible says, unrighteous mammon? And he said, out there in the world, they know how to do this, but my people are ignorant. And they're being set up to be captive because of that element. And you don't have to be a billionaire or some, you know, TikTok guru suddenly getting paid for all of your likes or however that works in order to steward your finances and grow them in the counsel of the Lord. How many of you know what ESG is? Raise your hand if you know what ESG is. Look around the room. I don't see a single hand up. Ha, huh, all right, back there. In 2016, President Obama greenlighted a set of guidelines that went into all say all, of the financing institutions, banks, investment companies, portfolio managers, retirement accounts, all of that. Do you know what ESG stands for? It stands for compliance with the environmental regulations, compliance with the social, social norms and compliance with government regulations. E, environment. I am specifically talking about the whole green agenda. Social, I'm specifically talking about equity, diversity, What's the other one? Huh? Somebody's saying inclusion. <laughs> I like that. Equity, diversity, and inclusion. Sounds nice on the surface, but just wait. And then government. What is legislated and now much of what is being established as regulations is not legislated. It's being set in by bureau bureaucracies that are unelected. But do you know what ESG means for you? It means that financial institutions, all of the people who deal with our money are now being set on a platform where they determine whether or not they do business with you according to whether or not you are compliant with environmental, social, and governance as prescribed by the people prescribing those guidelines. Does that surprise you? But did you know about it? Did you know that as a small, and I know this from firsthand experience from our working with our city council, because our city council in Charlotte, North Carolina, tried to sneak in a, 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 a passage of a regulation in our city where the city council put it in paper that the Charlotte city would never do business with a vendor that didn't... Uh, um, comply with the environmental, social, and governance rules. And it meant, and it was, it, it was a double-edged sword, but it literally was aimed at preventing Christian business owners and small businesses from having a stake in what the, the, the contracts that our city was going to be giving out. This is serious stuff. But are, are we informing? Is anybody talking about it? And uh, 
But that's, that's just one. This has been going on since 2016. And do you know how I found out about it? My portfolio manager didn't even know about it. He's been in the banking and finance for uh, three and a half decades. And I stumbled upon it because I was looking at the markets in various sectors. And I started discovering these growth sectors that were all in their under language had ESG, just those letters stuck in there. And so I went to look and see. I mean, this is a movement in relation to how we are able to access and use our own money, people. And I got to tell you, if the church is the last to be wise about this stuff, we are being set up to be crippled in a difficult time. And I believe in the supernatural. God can send it by birds and all that kind of stuff. But I think there's a place where Jesus is saying, look, you guys, I've been giving you a lot of stuff for a lot of years. And it's time. It's time. It's time to grow up. So, you know, in um, Aslan's discussion with Lucy, she said, you're bigger. And he said, that's because you're older. You're more mature. So how big is your God? I was a little worried with Darren continuing to make this statement about God sitting on us. <laughs> because I became sort of infamous a few years ago for coining a phrase about, but God, and the fact that he's got a really big one. So I was trying not to actually imagine or visualize. I, I, I don't know. And then there's the whole Moses thing. And well, anyway, the glory, you know. Lord, say revival. So I am convinced that God wants us to participate in the counsel of the Lord. And I am going to submit to you, hopefully prophetically, but whatever, that where we're going to find the counsel of the Lord in this next season is in corporate prayer and fasting. As Jesus said, when you come together like that in my name, I'm there in your midst. And can I just say this also? Because I believe that that corporate prayer and fasting will be one of the hallmarks of where revival is happening. And secondarily, I want to submit to you that there are certain things that God has designed for his city, for his army, that will always be the design. And there is nothing in this book, if this is still your handbook for how God does business, but there is nothing in this book that suggests he does what he does without ordered leadership that he has approved. And... Um, this may, as our friend Lance Walnow is um, like to say, this may go down like a rat sandwich. <laughs> I think that honestly, that we should consider the kinds of Gathering together as two and three and four individuals for the purpose of spiritual experiences. I suggest to you that perhaps it's time for us to consider that those kinds of scenarios also need to become places where there is actually ordained and seasoned leadership that is practiced and experienced in like ecstasies. You can, do we need to explain this more? 
Darren, let's get in a conversation. Please, a few words. Yeah, how many of you were here in the 11, 30, 11 o'clock service this morning? And at the end, I mean, listen, my, my, I'm surprised I still have my hair. <laughs> this man blew my mind. And one of the, the brilliant things about the anointing and someone who has made themselves a student and has dug in and humbled themselves and has sought God for, for a real ability to un unfold his real revelation from his word is that when they stand up and start opening and speaking, you come into that kind of a thing. Have you experienced that? You witnessed that, right? So just one of, of the many things that exploded in my head. I've been praying concerning revival and some of the seasons that we have been through as the church in America since 2016, and we've been through at least three very difficult, painful, radical, violent, dark ones. And I've been praying about those uh, things and what it was, what it is that God is looking for in his church, why he was allowing these various big, deep disappointments and difficulties to come wave after wave. And he's had me thinking about Jude's exhortation in his little short book. And they were in a situation where all kinds of self-appointed leaders were messing with the body of Christ with all kinds of distracting teachings and various other things and some of them even to the point of lasciviousness but I, I've been captured by looking deeply at the three warnings that Jude gave the church when he said, you've got to contend for your faith. And it wasn't just like, you need to do this for you. He was just, no, this is a matter of life or death. This is a matter of survival. This is your real end of life issue. And he used three examples from the Old Testament as a, a thing to beware of, to watch out for. And there are things that, that on its surface are just very remote. They're not in our sphere of thinking at all. And he said, the way of Cain, Balaam after prophet, and Korah's rebellion. And my Restoring the Foundations family, we can have a conversation about this if you would like, or you can stand up and rebuke me in open in this. And I honestly, I will take it. But can I just say something about the real biblical definition of the root of bitterness? It's not people have offended me or hurt me and I'm bitter and da da. The root of bitterness, it's described also used as the wor w word wormwood, and it appears in the Bible in Korah's rebellion. The root of bitterness is a root of rebellion and Korah's rebellion was fascinating because they assumed that they were equal because Korah had an ordination and an appointment and he was a tribal chieftain and leader and he had his two brothers with him and they began to look at Moses and Aaron and that whole situation and say, what makes you special? We're just like that and we've got these gifts too. You know what made him special? Made Moses and Aaron special? God had ordained them to that place. It wasn't that Moses stuttered and Korah didn't. He was, you know, wise and eloquent as a speaker. God had ordained him in that place. And I got to tell you, in this last few months, we have had to walk three established Holy Ghost season church congregations through attempted coups against the senior pastor by other Holy Ghost seasoned people. This is no fun. That's like a whole, you know, 
food truck of rat sandwiches so far. Sheesh. Whew. But I, I'm, I'm sharing with you some of the things that we're actually seeing and experiencing. And hopefully there's some things in it that will be responsibly delivered to you. And I know it's supposed to be a revival, you know. And we have an idea of, of but that's, that's why we bring Steve. <laughs> so, oh, there, you were translated. I thought you were caught up and you actually were just, you pulled a Philip on me. You better behave yourself. I'm going to call you out and you're going to have to tell your Ben her story. All right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but even, even in this, it, that place that we went to, that utter abandonment, that strong and fierce rejoicing and the joy, the freedom, the absolute assurance when everything of the world falls away in worship and we're in that place of shouting, holy, 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 because we see him and we feel him and we're connected and it's resonating and bouncing off the walls as we are together in that communal moment. That's not imaginary, that's for real. And thank God for that. Because uniquely, when Jesus told his disciples, basically, follow me, divest yourself of every other affection of this world, because ultimately, this is going to cost you that, and quite potentially actually cost you your life, I'm going to give you peace and joy unspeakable. So is that the mayo for the rat sandwich? I, I don't know. <laughs> a, little, a little joy lettuce in there. Slather on some, you know, peace mayo. Here, baby. Eat your rat sandwich. You guys are awesome. We are nothing without you. We are nothing without one another. God give us revival. God give us such a carried visitation, individually and communally, that nothing and no one could get us to separate from one another, betray one another, become offended at one another, go away from one another, call up one another's weaknesses and let the enemy take advantage of them because of it. God is calling for this new manifestation of a bride and an army. And... Most desperately, we could all cast our eyes to the east and see examples on our news every day and night right now of what it means to be courageous against impossible odds, and to be ready to lay down your life for a cause for the sake of a generation after you when probably you won't be alive to see it. I am Devastated beyond words when I remember the contradictions between Aleppo when it was a city filled with people and commerce and what that same cityscape looked like after this tyrant that is raining destruction on the cities of Ukraine 
was finished with it. There's so much about these events that are a sign and a wonder and a warning and a wake-up call and a call from heaven to the church in the earth concerning the times that we live in and the times ahead. The unrest that came to this city in the name of social justice, in the name of anti-discrimination, Open your mouth wide because this is a big rat. This is a monster rat. When we lived in South Florida, we lived on a, near the Keys, you know, the little water inlets and stuff. We had these river rats. I kid you not, the tail where it connected to the rat's body was as big around as a half dollar nearly. And I know because occasionally those things would find their way into the pipe system and would come up through the toilet. And when they stood up, I kid you not, when they stood up on their haunches, and I had it happen in my house more than once, stood up on their haunches looking at you like this is my territory, they were that tall. So this is a big rat sandwich you're getting ready to be served. American cities were assaulted by a pagan, anti-God, anti-black people anti-Christ false religion violent revolutionary movement and it was embraced and praised by the church across this nation it was embraced and praised and contributed to by millions of naive and innocent Americans. It was embraced and praised by all of our media, by all of our big corporations. And now some of them, like Amazon, are just quietly, you know, putting their hands behind their back and kind of tiptoeing away from all their support for BLM. And I said, I remember trying to warn people in our congregation, we're, we're blessed. I mean, you know, <clears throat> we have a very diverse congregation. But from day one, we laid out the facts on the spirit behind that whole movement. And the blood shed and bloodletting and curses that were devised to be rooted in every one of those altars that they made in every city where acts of violence had occurred. And at that time, I said to the folks that we shepherd, I said, if you have a BLM sticker on anything you own, if you have a BLM sign in your yard thinking it's going to protect you, if you have a BLM we support on any of your business logos, you, Christian, have deliberately opened the door and invited the curse to come on you and your family. And you better run and take it down kick it out, get rid of it. And if your pastors insist, I'm sorry. I mean, I, you know, this is revival talk. This is, this is revival talk, people. And you know what? It took a while for it to cycle around and cycle through and decimate thousands and thousands of people's lives and businesses and capture and pervert and further corrupt hundreds and hundreds of city governances and turn like a venomous serpent on Christians who wouldn't buy the lie 
And after COVID cycled through, very interesting truth started coming to light and people started going, well, maybe not. But don't forget, I mean, I saw it with my own eyes because it happened in my city. Thousands and thousands of people marching with their fists in the air. Thousands and thousands of people. And Charlotte's a very religious, Christian religious place. On their knees in soccer fields. In submission to that message and that movement. It was straight out of the pit of hell. And it wasn't hidden. But many were tricked by it initially. Let me tell you something. Anything that comes to you, promising you promotion by you being a victim is screwed up. Okay, I'm leaving that rat sandwich over there to rot. I'm, I'm done with it. I don't want to talk about that one anymore. So, um, oh, I don't want to talk about COVID. You've heard it all. And all this stuff is going to start coming out, maybe, if the CDC decides that we're not too infantile to have the data. And Tony Fauci gets out of the witness protection program. So moving along, moving right along, because we are running short on time. I like questions. I don't mind challenge. If I offend you, I honestly am not offended and am not unhappy for you to say, but wait a minute. That thing you said, blah, 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 that we can talk about it. That's another thing that needs to happen. One of the new indicators of real revival is a shift in who's talking all the time. How many of you have questions tonight on various things that I've said? Raise your hand. Stand up real quick. Stand up real quick if you have a question. Hang on. Don't sit down. Chicken? Thank you. It's like Jesus isn't watching. Okay. We're going to pause the thought over there because we're going to... Are you up to do a question? Okay. Starting right here. Shout it out loud so we know what it is. So what should we do about ESG then? Now that we know about it. About ESG? Yes. The church needs to get together the prophets, if there are real prophets, and business people need to look into it, and we need to come up with the counsel of the Lord in terms of how we will be able to own and use and invest our money without being ostracized because of our religious beliefs. And there is not a plan right now. There is not a plan. There is just recently uh, the suggestion of creating a different banking system. It's not easy to do. But we would have to have everybody be willing to buy in and all kinds of stuff. So, but nobody's even talking about this kind of stuff. That's my concern. And it's there. It's been there for, you know, what, eight, six, eight years so far? So, yeah, thank you for asking. And that's our question, Lord. What is the plan? How are we supposed to deal with this? How serious are we supposed to take it? Well, you can ask guys like Mike Lindell and Lance Wall now and us how your banking institution have been questioning you about why you want to make that withdrawal out of your account and what are you going to use that money for? My bank that I've been banking with for 27 years is suddenly asking me what I plan to do with my money? It's because their guidelines
sometimes have ESG and they could be deciding whether or not they're going to give me my money or whether or not I can be an ongoing client with them. That's literally what ESG is. So anyway, some of you, how many people are in banking here in finance of some kind? If you're in finance, stand up. If you're in finance of some kind, I need, we need you to start finding out what the possible plan is, okay? We do, we need the banking industry people to start contributing to this. Okay, obviously I don't have the answer, but I know that's a problem. And it doesn't portend well for believers. And we're already seeing some of that stuff. Okay, where's the other people that stood up? Gail, you stood up. Was a banking question? thinking about doing something like that because uh, I hear little things now Do and you then. know what? If we do, the only thing we're hearing is the new prophetic thing about the next presidential election. Give me a break! I don't care about the next presidential election. <laughs> Rat sandwich. <laughs> can, we, can we be honest? I'm tired of the church being used and left as infants. Really. Okay, and, and honestly, I, and I've asked some of the guys who deal in some of this stuff, and just like when I said to my financial, my portfolio manager, I want to know about the ESG sector, I want to know how much my investment institution is determined that that's what's going to drive them in terms of me being a client and using my money, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, what, ESG? And he looked into it and then, you know, it is one of the fastest, those things are the fastest growing sectors in the stock market. What does that mean? That means that people, institutions and investors are coming on board in alignment with all of that. And what does that portend? The people who won't comply potentially will be ostracized or penalized or restricted in some way. So, all right, let's move on because I'm, that's all I know. And I'm, I'm trying to get some folks that are in the know to think about it realistically, address it, if it needs to be addressed, to inform the church. I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. So I believe that there is some corruption just in our system and in the life that we are A need for the change um, and I just was wondering your opinion on um, balance environmental wise and I was wondering how you think that what we can do as a church to help our people grow together um, not only in the struggles of corruption but also environmental wise Um, the first thing that I'll say is what I started with. I honestly believe, and I know we've experienced this for a number of years, where we find the counsel of the Lord. And it's biblical. It's what the apostles did when they needed to know the mind of the Lord on something. They got together. They prayed together. They fasted together on those particular questions and they sought the Lord and he gave them the answer and they decided among themselves, this is the answer of the Lord. This is his wisdom. And they understood from that time together how to mobilize towards it. And this, I will say, I believe I'm convicted that the church in a given locale will have the apostolic prophetic word, the counsel of the Lord for that locale. And yes, while I totally uh, agree that uh, a person with a genuine ordained prophet gift and office may have some kind of a big banner word of this is going to happen or this is such and such and such, I don't in general see that coming and being the reigning or driving word over local churches in a particular locale. I believe God has ordained and equipped the body of Christ to be the salt and light in their own jurisdiction. Because guess what? You live here. So it's important 
that you aren't distracted and worried about some issue up there while your city is being taken out from under you. Hard to do in a world of distractions with cell phones. Wait, say it again. Hard to do in a world of distractions with cell phones. You know, I mean, gosh, it's shiny thing. Every prophecy is shiny thing. Every Christ is shiny thing. And in the meantime, we're losing, potentially losing impact in our city. And can I say something about everybody's, we're all familiar now with the seven mountains illustration, right? You've got these seven mountains. And I, I've talked to Lance about this. I said, Lance, I don't think the way you used to draw that was biblical because you drew all seven mountains the same height. And my Bible, like, you know, when we flew in, I took a zillion pictures of Mount Hood and its proud peak standing up above a thick layer of clouds over the landscape. And I said, that clarity up there in that clear air, that's the mountain of the house of the Lord. That's where the church is located up there. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's what the Bible says. It says the mountain of the house of the Lord. And that's not some ethereal New Jerusalem in heaven. It is literally this, the body of organic believers in every generation that come from what Daniel saw, a stone made without hands flung out of heaven and it hit the foundations of the world empires and this mountain began to rise. That's the church. The mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and over all the little hills, the little hills will flow to it. The church is theoretically, in my opinion, in a big general sweep. We have two assignments, prayer and proclamation of the gospel. That's the gospel unto salvation and transformation. It's not the gospel unto self-help. So, in that context, from the mountaintop, where Jesus has established us by his death, burial, resurrection, ascension into heaven, and the sending of the Spirit, we have two principal functions. One is to equip many believers to go out of the mountain and down through the earth and up into these other mountains and begin to influence and uh, transform the hearts of the influencers. I'm not even saying God has called you to be at the top of the mountain. I'm saying he has called you to be able to minister the gospel to the people who are sitting at the top of the mountain. And hallelujah, if you get there, we had an amazing testimony in our church congregation just this last week of a young man who works for a major corporation. And for seven years, he was making unique contributions that were promoting and expanding and putting the corporation first forward. And his class of employment, his title, didn't afford him any benefit from it. And he was getting really discouraged. It's like, God, have you even called me to this? Seven years and he'd do this major thing and it became their next big boon and nothing for him, no recognition, no whatever. Again and again. He went on a fast. This happened literally just last week. On the fourth day of the fast, he was contacted by his supervisor and called to a unexpected meeting with the corporation execs and HR. And in that meeting, he found out that a couple of the people who had been watching and seeing the contribution that he was making had been in a wrestling match with HR to get this young man in the position that he deserved to be and that he was talented to do to bring the corporation forward. And they did something that had never been done before in the history of that company. It's one of the world influencer companies. 
and promoted that kid from nothing to executive. Literally created an executive position with all the, you know, whatever perks and whatever. Then there's just a lot of really redemptive details around all of that because now he also is a spokesman for all of the second class people that are really the ones who are making that company flourish. And there's never been a forward track for them. So it's interesting. Anyway, and, but in that, it was interesting because one of his bosses has a saying, trust the delay. That might be a word of encouragement for a lot of folks in here tonight on various things you may be frustrated about, banging on heaven, nothing showing up, so on and so forth. Just perhaps God is actually working to something better. And I can tell you in that situation, we've had two situations like that in the last week. And it was interesting because just before these two miraculous things happened, the Lord literally spoke to Mahash about the promise in delay. And he had started working on his ideas and looking at scripture and all this. And then suddenly these two miracles pop up where the delay was the key. And at a certain moment, boom, the promise that was there manifested. So for somebody that's been very frustrated losing hope because of, of a prolonged empty space and getting your answers or your breakthrough. I want to encourage you tonight. Stand strong in the Lord. Strengthen yourself in the Lord. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Believe in his promises. Continue to have confidence in the certainty that he keeps all of his promises. And trust the delay. Keep being faithful. Being excellent. Don't fall back through despair or discouragement. And see what God does. So I hope that's a blessing. It's a little less ratty. Okay, over here. Did you have something else? And the environment thing is a whole, and if we're talking about ecological, you know, whatever. It, honestly, we're at the point where it has become the new world religion. And, you know, in an avalanche, if there's a person on the ski slope standing next to a tree and the avalanche is rolling down, which one are you going to (laughs) save? Sorry, some of these things are not rocket science. But that one has become a ruling world driver. And whenever something becomes that powerful, you have to determine the spirit behind it and whether it's light. Jesus rules in light. He doesn't rule in darkness. He lets everybody know what's going on. If you look at the whole scene in Revelation, he rules through righteous delegated authority. All of those things with the presence of his four living creatures that roam to and fro through the earth and blah, blah, blah. Well, if something is beginning to dominate world economies and world leaders and all of that and drive all of their decisions to the point of insanity. Let me ask you a question. How many components of your electric car and your electric charging spaces actually have to use fossil fuel to create those things? (laughs) This is not rocket science. Let me ask you another question. What happens when we have a major cyber attack or an EMP and there is no, I mean, we get blackouts and lose power grid from natural disasters. You got the whole world needing to plug their car in because their battery's dead and there's no juice to plug it into. I mean, you know, so anyway, I'm not, you know, anti-environment, but Darren preaching this morning, I got to tell you this one thing. I'm on this track now because this was a breakthrough in something I've been seeking the Lord about. And that was the mystery of the whole dynamic with Cain. And that, you know, people say all kinds of stuff. But the key for me that clarified it was when you were talking this morning 
And I suddenly saw that Adam and his family were the first priestly families. And that whole thing of Abel's offering and Cain's offering, well, later, 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 Nadab and Abihu, remember? Strange fire. The sons of Aaron, do you remember? Cain pulled that right at the beginning. And that's why his offering was rejected. He's like, I mean, he'd see, he was in the priestly family. He knew what the right offerings were, the acceptable ones. And he chose out of whatever it was to devise his own offering. Firstborn son, Adam tilled the ground, Cain tilled the ground, walking into my father's arts. I, I don't know what it was, but that was the key in recognizing that as priests of God, they had revelation about what offerings were acceptable. Boom. And Jude at the end warns the church in the end of days, he says, don't go in the way of Cain. It's not just about murdering your brother. I think it was more about the priestly calling and perverting that. Anyway, we're going on too long. Let me take one more question and then we'll uh, roll back around check, and check, 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 I need check, some help. Check, 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 check. Question over here. Oh. Yes, I'm not, not going to be a chicken. I'm going to ask. Uh, when you were speaking about the BLM and the Native Americans and churches and even pastors aligning with that agenda, I, it's, it's really grievous to think of that. And I wondered if you have seen the ramifications, as, as you said, that has... Um, I'm out and it revealed itself more. So I think that's part one of my question, but I can ask to the second part being... Uh, what I feel like a press, this is a press conference Sorry. or something. So. <laughs> I can stop there. No, no. Okay, there. just part two. No, was, um, what can I do? How can I pray um, to see restoration of the damage that was caused? Well, in my opinion, there are a couple of really practical things. Number one is you need to know very clearly in simple terms that you can communicate what the actual root of those three philosophies from those three women that came together and founded that movement are. And it's, it used to be easy to find it. They've scrubbed the internet from a lot of the stuff now, by the way. But, um, and we, we can spend some time, if I'd be happy to talk to you a little bit about it. It's probably stuff you know, but I can tell you what I know. And I, I ended up, because I, I was very concerned about it and watching the church and especially the millennial church in my city, just glamming onto that thing. And it really concerned me. And so I, I you know, went and got a lot of the, actual documents that then were major news articles and stuff that are scrubbed now. They're not there anymore about the three women who founded that movement and their uh, philosophies, their personal, political, and spiritual philosophies. And every bit of it is completely satanic, literally pagan satanic. So anyway, we won't go there. Um, second part of your question, oh, what we can do about it. One of the things that if, for instance, your city, don't go confront your neighbor because they put a BLM, you know, sign in their yard thinking they're being, you know, recognizing their white privilege and being generous and trying to not be racist and maybe protect themselves from people who might want to come and bang down their door. I don't know. But don't do that. But know the roots so that if the opportunity presents itself, that you can end a, in a congenial way, have a conversation with why you wouldn't support that movement for those reasons. That as a Christian, on your social justice, your reasoning is different. Number one, that we're all one blood and are all created as image bearers and have an obligation communally towards one another. I mean, there are some clear, clean, and no strings attached ones that are genuine for a Christian. But, um, and then if your city has one of those altars, and that's what those sites were, where these various, you know, police brutality and murders and various things happened, killings happened, and protests happened, they were designed to be altars, offering those sacrifices to the pagan gods, uh, and a Nigerian religion, and so on and so forth. So... You should go there in your authority 
and loose your city from every spiritual chain and hook connected to that. Yeah, and again, I recommend don't go alone, but that could be a practical measure for churches to go and do a little prayer walk and just say no and let the Lord lead you specifically in terms of specifically what powers to break their stranglehold or connection into the governance and the vulnerable in your city and cleanse those places because the Bible is very serious about sites on geography where blood has been shed and those sites in that movement and in that terrible summer of love, those sites were all captured and devoted to blood violence, meaning it would continue to perpetuate more and more hatred between brothers and more blood violence. That's what blood violence does. And all of those protest sites spiritually were dedicated to that. Isn't that weird? It's just terrible. It's terrible. So, sorry, Darren. Okay, one more. Shout it out, please. Almost there. Oh, thank you. And then I have something to, that I would like to say to this gentleman right here in the lanyard. I just want to say I am so grateful to be here. I didn't think I could afford it. This is my best friend, Lucy, who taught me. Thank you so much. I am just, I'll, I'll just say this. I thought I had uh, a vision for my job. And, and the Lord spoke to me and said, no, Lisa. Don't, multi-care is part of the government. You're gonna have to get a vaccination. And I'm like, I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know what God wants me to do, but thank you for, I'm, I'm not going back there. So let, let me, and I'll, you know, I'll, just, I'll just share with you, somebody said, talk about COVID. What, what we did in our congregation is we're, we, we have a general apostolic ethos of our congregation and we are unified on it. And the center of that is the mission of the gospel. That's the center of it. And then our practical principal activity is that corporate prayer and fasting, um, you know, and worshiping the Lord, that, that kind of fellowship. And in our local church, and I believe that this is the way the local church is supposed to function, is that the ordained leadership there, to, together with their counselors and then in communication with the church people, for that body, they need to understand how that body as one family is going to navigate these difficult things that, that we face in different jurisdictions. And there will not be a blanket one except a general rule from scripture. And for us, the general rule from scripture is where there was, there was um, divisions and wrangling and competition and people accusing people over things of the law and what they could eat and what they shouldn't eat and this and that and something else. And we said, look, in this church, we are one family and we are for one another. And in this issue, specifically the vaccines, your family counsel and conscience needs to be free to be exercised, whichever way that means. And in that context, we freed our people from the fear of taking the vaccine if they felt like they were a good candidate and they needed to do it. They needed to get their counsel in their family and go for it. And the Bible says, you drink anything poison, it won't hurt you. <laughs> On the other hand, we said, for all of those who decided they didn't feel good about it, they didn't want to do it. We said your conscience will have free exercise here so there will be no division in this house. So we did the same thing with masking and so on and so forth. So anyway, how come? <laughs> I'm going to go back to Aslan. Okay, so I'll say one more thing. Are y'all right? 
You guys are just incredible. Steve! Can't you help me? Can't you make things happy in here a little bit? I'm sorry. I know. I know. Thank you. Oh, you can feel the glory moving towards us. What's your name? Josh? You're amazing. You are really amazing. Will you allow me to share with you, watching you lead worship, the first thing I noticed is you have these moments where you are acutely aware of whether or not the people are actually connecting. And I saw you doing that. And just set that over. And it reminded me, sorry, I hope this doesn't offend you, of a rabbit, actually. <laughs> the quick movement, you know, and the little whiskers, and you were like really in touch and in tune with what was going on. <laughs> and then... I saw you in these moments where you fully put your feet into the place of leading when the sound of heaven was fierce. Are you familiar with Monty Python? You know the attack rabbit? <laughs> right for the juggler, right? So, I, I apologize, but I... I just, I've been thinking about you all day in those two um, scenes. That sensitivity and that fierceness are absolutely brilliant. And we receive and celebrate them. And the other thing that I would like to suggest to you, I don't know if you've ever looked into how conductors learn to be conductors. And if you haven't, it, I just, I want to make this suggestion. In your spare time, go and look, all that spare time, look a little bit into how conductors are trained to be conductors. Because I think there will be some things in there that you really resonate with. And if you think about the role of a conductor in terms of being able to bring all of the members of the symphony into a harmonious, powerful participation that communicates and captures an atmosphere. There might be something there for you. You said nothing. You said nothing. This morning at the end of his amazing message, on origins and I was just my brain was exploding every five minutes and then Darren says do you have anything to say well way back there before the near <laughs> far it's stuck in my brain but way in there somewhere he was talking about Andrea and teaching the kids and how how much how strong she is in understanding how to make wise decisions. So at the end of the thing, he asked me if I had anything to say. And I, know, I knew him. I was going to get him. I knew he was like, oh, yeah, Bonnie's going to come up here and she's going to say something deeply spiritual and everybody's going to ooh and ah, and I'm going to look really good. And I was like, yeah, I learned something today. I learned that if Andrea Stott had been with Moses, a lot of things would have gone differently. <laughs> so I think I'm done for this evening. Thank you. Or maybe I'm not. So let's do this. I want to suggest to you that there is a single scripture where we can find a kind of counsel of the Lord and a shift in the way we pray corporately. Yeah, okay? That seven mountains thing, the, the two things, equipping and sending the saints out. The other one 
is perpetually dwelling in that place with the prayer of the church over the other mountains, literally restraining them. That's what the Bible says. It says in Psalm 149, the Lord has taken pleasure in his people and he will beautify the meek the teachable with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. To execute, say execute. Vengeance upon the heathen. Listen, I'm looking at some nasty dudes been running out various aspects of the lives of the meek people. And I'm ready for some things to shift. And if there's a place for me in the church in the top of that mountain in prayer to execute those things, I'm on it. Right? And punishments... That's rewards for doing bad stuff. I don't know about you, but I got my own hit list. There needs to be some punishments, including a laptop. Listen, Ukraine, this situation, it didn't get there overnight. And the political oligarchy and elite in America, their hands are dirty and red up to their elbows. So, anyway, to bind, say to bind, their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them the judgment written, this honor, say this honor, honor, this honor have all his saints. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So now you can stand up. I want us to recognize that this corporiety of praying people has power. And I want us to literally stretch a hand as though it had the sword of the Lord. And what does that mean? It means to execute vengeance on wickedness, to bind principalities and powers and earthly rulers who are about wickedness, that a spiritual power will prevent them from being able to carry out their plans. So, we want to pray concerning the horrible evil being inflicted on regular people. I've read that 63% of the Ukrainian population claims Christianity in various forms. It's probably one of the reasons that many of the people that we saw interviewed by various members of the press, one of the first or last things they said was, please pray for us, pray for us, pray for us. It was like, even more than America send help, pray for us, we need your prayers. One of our members got a message from friends this week, said this, and there are folks in our own family that have taken in some of the refugees that have actually made it out and come all the way to the States. But yesterday evening, we got this message from a friend in Kiev. I want to encourage you with words of soldiers and regular people we know, of people who come from different frontiers of the war, and they tell us this, quote, 
we can feel your prayers. Sometimes something really inexplicable is happening as if an invisible hand really conducted bullets and other projectiles away from us so that they fly past. We're getting victories in very difficult situations as if someone was leading them. We become invisible for the enemies, but we ourselves can see them in full darkness and know what to do and how. This encourages us and gives us strength. We believe that the Lord Jesus Christ himself is defending Ukraine. Please do not stop praying, but keep on praying continually. We need you. So let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray.
take authority over the spirit of violence, the destroyer and waster that has determined to create millions of orphans. And we bind your power. We speak to you in the name of the Father of heaven. And we call the written judgments against you. Cease and desist. God, we pray, rescue, deliver every father in battle. Lord, we pray, preserve their life to continue their inheritance and come home to embrace their children. Lord, we cry out to you for the orphan. We break the orphan spirit off of Ukraine. Lord, we pray that what you did with Gideon, what you did with Gideon, you would do on the battlefield. God, we make intercession. And to you, Lion of Judah, God of Abraham, we make intercession for this man, Zelensky, a son of Abraham, who finds himself in this dire circumstance, we pray, God of Israel, would you come down and put your spirit on him that he might have supernatural wisdom and courage and power. Come on, saints, let's pray for all of those separated families. There are many who have volunteered, but not all of them have volunteered, have literally, as you know, been turned back at the border and as men forced to go back to fight. Let's pray now for every man and woman that's actually in Ukraine and has taken up arms or has decided to literally stand in resistance. Pray now. enlightened prayer I want you just to pray it out just pray it out there will be many happening all at once for individuals whatever just now begin to loose those prophetic prayers I see it like a barrage of arrows like a barrage of arrows like a barrage of arrows an ark, a shield, a dome. God, we pray with these arrows that fly like a barrage for a shield of protection over Ukraine. Lord, we make intercession that you would cause a cloud to cover. God, we intercede for the cities. They've ravaged Mariupol. God, they've ravaged the cities. We intercede for Kiev. We intercede for Lviv. God, spare these cities. 
Yeah, Father, we pray tonight that you put a wall around the city of Kiev. That, Lord, you will protect the city with fire. And, Lord, nothing will be able to penetrate that city. We pray the dome of the Lord over the city of Kiev. And we call the missiles dead. We call the guns dead. We call the ammunition useless in the name of Jesus. And let every weapon that has been formed against the city of Kiev fall to the ground, Lord. Fall to the ground. Lord, I pray for a spirit of repentance upon the Russian army. Lord, I pray for a spirit of conviction on the Russian army. God, I pray they will lay their weapons down. They will lay their weapons down and they will go home. And I say, Russia, go home. Russia, go home. Russia, go home. Go home. Go home. home. And Lord, we pray for the... Um the Russians who are protesting in their cities in, Ru in Russia right now on behalf of the Ukrainian people, and they're being detained for doing that. Lord, we just pray for our, our Russian brothers and sisters that are standing up with courage, knowing that they'll be arrested for doing it. Lord, give them courage, and let all our brothers and sisters across Russia stand up and protest and say, no, no, no. In Jesus' name, I pray for strength for them. I pray for courage. And my body said that the courage will be palatable, that it will be shared and, 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 and infectious, and that all the Christians will stand up and have a voice and say, this is wrong, and we don't not back it in Jesus' name, even if it means we end up in prison. In Jesus' name, give them that courage, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hope. Yes, Father. Yes, Father, I pray the victory of light over darkness. I pray the victory of, Father, Ukraine over the power of devils that are coming from gate of hell, Father. I pray, Father, the same experience that Abraham had when he was coming back from war and he was bringing a spoil with him. The same experience I pray that Ukraine is going to have and meet Melchizedek, the king of Salem, Father, and the victory over the darkness and be a stand, Father, for the victory. And the world know that there is a king and his name, Jesus, Jesus Christ, hallelujah. Father, in the same way that you were able to take Pharaoh's heart and you hardened it, Lord God, for your purposes in the land of Egypt, Father, I pray that you would take the heart of Putin right now in your hands, oh God, that you would turn the heart of Putin, Lord God, turn his heart back to his own country, in his own land, Lord God, like a mighty stream in your hand is the heart of a man. So, Father, I pray that you would turn his heart, Lord God. Turn his heart, Lord God, from this direction, Lord. And turn it back to his own country, Father. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, Lord. Father, we say contend, O Lord, with those who contend with the Ukraine. Fight against those who fight against the Ukraine. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for their help. Draw out also the spear and the javelin and close up the way of those who pursue and persecute her and say to her, I am your deliverance. Let them be put to shame and dishonor who seek and require the life of the Ukraine. Let them be turned back and confounded who plan their hurt. Let them be as chaff before the wind with the angel of the Lord driving them out. And let their way be dark and slippery and let the angel of the Lord pursuing them and afflicting them. Let destruction befall upon their foes, unaware, and let the net that they hid for the Ukraine catch them and let them fall into that very destruction. So, Dinah hated tonight the angel of the of the Ukraine. The angel of the Ukraine. 
Isn't that amazing? And that's what I was feeling like, and I was asking the Lord, like, God, just release the angel over Ukraine, the governing angel over the Ukraine, Father. We release that angel right now, Father. We say, yes, Lord. We say, yes, God. We commission that angel tonight, God. We commission that angel, Father. We say, yes, go. Go and let the battle be the Lord's. Let the battle be the Lord's in the name of Jesus. Let the battle be the Lord's. Father, I just honor you, God. I honor you, Father. So the flag that was flown over the Ukraine used to be a golden lion on blue. That's what we are tonight. It's like that's what we're seeing, the lion of the tribe of Judah. It's a golden lion on a field of blue. So Father, we thank you, God, that we are in tune with you tonight, God. Father, that we are hearing the voice of the Father and we are declaring and decreeing over this nation, God, that the Lion of the tribe of Judah will now arise and go forth in the name of Jesus and will devour the enemy before them. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. yeah 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 the picture i see is of a of a woman pressing up against a wall pressing up against a large stone wall and father we thank you lord for the bride in europe the bride of christ that is pressing that is pushing against a wall tonight and we thank you lord that there's there's this remnant bride in russia and she's pressing up against the same wall as this remnant bride it's the same bride pushing up against the wall and we join tonight we join tonight as the bride of christ one bride to push against this wall and lord we ask for grace to push against this wall this wall of corruption lord this demonic wall that has been built to subvert lord your plans and purposes on the earth lord we have no we we we, have, we understand so little of what is actually taking place and yet we join tonight with the bride we join tonight as the bride to press against this wall and lord we ask for your strength lord your strength for the bride in russia your strength for the bride in ukraine and we push tonight and we push tonight and lord we ask oh god for a breakthrough to break through this wall to break through this wall to break through this wall we push tonight we push tonight not by our might not by our power but by the grace of god by the strength of god by the life of god by the light of god we thank you lord that it'll be the bride of christ that brings the breakthrough the breakthrough will not come through governments and kings the breakthrough will come through this warrior bride we say push push we say push push you can do it push push push
Father, we thank you for the awakening and the unity in the spirit of the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists, the great ecclesia, the called out ones in Europe. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father, for even the tie and the natural between war and revival. And we thank you, Lord, that this will be the beginning of a shaking throughout Europe. That this will be, this will be the, the turning of a tide. That this will be when the strong, when the stronghold of, of the Muslim influence over that country will be shattered. And we thank you, Lord, that a sound of thunder, the sound of the voice of the Lord that hovers over the waters. We thank you, Lord, for that what the enemy meant for evil, Lord, you are going to turn it. And we thank you, Lord, there will be a sound of thunder. There will be a sound of awakening. There will be a sound of harvest. There will be a sound of a great uprising, a sound of revolution. It will be a sound of, a, of, a, of the lion waking up and arising in this hour. Hour. We thank you, Lord, for this sound of the righteous and the ecclesia, the governing ones that are coming up in this hour. And we thank you, Lord, that the enemy will regret ever messing, ever messing, ever tampering, ever tampering in this region. Hallelujah. Anyone can find out what will happen, said Aslan. If you go back to the others now and wake them up and tell them you have seen me again and that you must all get up at once and follow me, what will happen? There's only one way of finding out. That is what you want me to do, gasped Lucy. Yes, the little one, said Aslan. Will the others see you too, asked Lucy. Certainly not at first, said Aslan. Later on, it depends. But they won't believe me, said Lucy. It doesn't matter, said Aslan. Oh dear, oh dear, I was so pleased at finding you again. And I thought you'd let me stay. And I thought you'd come roaring in and frighten all the enemies away like last time. And now everything's going to be horrid. It is hard for you, little one, said Aslan but things never happen the same way twice. It has been hard for us all in Narnia before now. Lucy buried her head in his mane to hide from his face, but there must have been magic in his mane. She could feel lion strength going into her and quite suddenly she sat up. I'm sorry, Aslan, she said, I'm ready now. Now you are a lioness, said Aslan. And now all Narnia will be renewed. But come, we have no time to lose. It says, he got up and walked with stately, noiseless paces back to the belt of the dancing trees through which she had just come. Lucy went with him, laying a rather tremulous hand on his mane. The trees parted to let them through and for one second assumed their human forms completely. Lucy had a glimpse of tall and lovely wood gods and wood goddesses all bowing to the lion. The next moment they were trees again, but still bowing with such graceful sweeps of branch and trunk that their bowing was itself a kind of dance. Now, child, said Aslan, when they had left the trees behind them, I will wait here. Go and wake the others and tell them to follow. And if they will not, then you at least must follow me alone.
you're going to be hanging out out here signing books. Is that right? Yeah, folks still want, want that. Or uh, I can do it tomorrow. Awesome. And then you'll be signing tomorrow as well. Yeah. Um, or we can sign. Is she tomorrow. signing before, if I, if before I, after I, the session tomorrow? What's that, Bonnie? Yeah, if I sign tomorrow, people don't have to wait around. Oh, you, oh, you're fine. We're, yeah, we'll be hanging out. It's just up to you. Is that good? All right, Bonnie will be out there for a little bit, okay? Is that good? We'll, we'll set a timer on um, signing books. Okay, definitely check out all of their resources. Guys, we'll be back. Man, oh, wasn't tonight you. amazing? Thank you. My Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My Lord. So cool, Bonnie. So good. What an awesome night. We'll be back tomorrow at uh, 10 a.m., okay? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Awesome.